Our next speaker is Dr. Kelly Coles. And she's an involved activist, an educator, a businesswoman, and has expensive background in the fields of healthcare and education. And um, recently I went to Ohio for the National School Board's Leadership Council. And if I'm not mistaken, you're the founder of that. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So, and she is here live in person to talk to us today. I want to welcome up now, Dr. Kelly Coles. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Maybe I need to talk louder. Hi, Jamal. Hi. We've spoken on the phone a few times, but I wanted to thank you all for inviting me. Uh, Richard Urban and Jamal Jackson, I've talked to you. Andy Wells, talked to him many times. And I, I always say, I'll go wherever three people gather. It is really important for everyone to understand what is happening in education. And Andy just helped us quite a bit understand curriculum issues. And I wanted to explain my background because what I found out was actually an innocent start. So I ran for school board back in 2009. I was trying to get on our school board simply because our school kept coming back to us for more and more and more money. And most of us in the community were saying, we just can't afford more. 60% of your um, property taxes go to the school district. And every couple of years, it just kept rising and rising and rising while our incomes were not. So we are saying we, we can't afford it. What I wanted to know at the time was, are you spending our money responsibly? So it was really an innocent start. I really wanted to understand the financial end. Once I got on there, I'll tell you the rest of the story. But I wanted to explain this because I really want, as Andy said, people to start understanding what is happening in public education and trying your best to get involved in it. So, and I'm going to uh, explain why Richard and I have a similar goal in mind, because the abstinence-based education was something that was rejected once I got there once I understood what was happening. So let me start at the beginning. 2009, our school district was going on the ballot for the fourth time, asking us for more money. We had rejected them three times before that. The fourth time, I just kept putting the no sign at the end of my driveway, vote no. And then my neighbors said, because I was finding information, I would give that to my neighbors and saying, we are paying enough. We've had a levy on our ballot every 18 months. Seriously, when is there enough money in our system? My tax bill was approaching $9,400 a year. We were at our end. I have five children to raise. I have other financial obligations. I cannot keep doing this. So I would put the information in my neighbor's mailboxes. Shh, don't tell them that's not a good idea. But um, they finally called me and said, you need to run for school board. I said, that's not my, that's not my charge. My charge is to raise my family, run my uh, private consulting business, and to you know, do what I can in the neighborhood. But when they invited me to run for school board, it was in my head, it was in my heart, and I couldn't get rid of it. I thought, maybe I am the one to run for school board. Maybe I am. I was told by a lot of people, you'll never win. You'll never win because you're a no voter. These School district people can get out there and they badmouth no voters like crazy. The venom that they have for somebody that says no to them is tremendous. And I said, well, I'm going to run anyway. I'm told by a lot of people that I, I can't win because I'm a no voter. But I had five children inside this public system. I had every dime I owned invested in that home. And I wanted to make sure that the system worked for us because yeah. that's Good school district does attract people to your area, does make your home value at least worth what you're asking most of the time. So I ran and I won more votes than anybody on the ballot. So it told the school district, we want her to speak for us. Wasn't sure why, but definitely, you know, the other side came after me with venom during the campaign. In, in every way they could, they tried to stop me talking to the public. The union endorsed the other three candidates. The newspaper endorsed the other three candidates. A little frustrating for me being that fourth candidate, but they were essentially telling people who not to vote for, which was me. However, the community saw that as good information and said, actually, we disagree with you, union. We disagree with you, newspaper. We're going to have her come in here. Came in. I had four people 
that did not like me. It's a five member board, four people who totally didn't like me. And I thought they don't even know me. How could they not like me? They don't know who I am. They don't know Kelly Coles. They just knew that I was a no voter. I was a person saying no to giving them more money. And therefore I was to be disliked. Well, that's kind of a weird way to approach life, but okay. But guys, within a few months, I would simply do my homework. I would simply vote no. The other four would vote yes on something. I would vote no. And there's always this little gasp in the audience, like how dare you not be a united front? How dare you say no to us? Because the other four had gone through this training just like I did. As soon as a school board member who should be stopping a lot of this stuff that's going on, right? We're saying, where are you school board? We elect you to represent the community you serve. Why are you leaving us? Why are you not voting to support us and to protect the children? Well, I learned as soon as I was elected, I was whisked away to a weekend with the state school board association in Ohio. It's the Ohio school board association. That association teaches our brand new school board members how to be good school board members. So it was a weekend, two days of being told that your job is to present a united front. Your job is to to be a cheerleader for your district. Your job is to do lots of high fives and pats on the back and celebrations about how good we're doing. Your job is to not walk through the buildings. That makes people nervous. Your job is to do whatever the superintendent and treasurer tell you to do. You hired them, now you have to trust them. So the whole weekend was an indoctrination. And I was nauseated that whole weekend, guys. And I, I figured out that God has blessed me with something. And that's to be nauseated when I'm around evil. <laughs> and I didn't quite connect the dots then, but I thought I left that room each day knowing I was not going to be a good school board member, according to them, that I didn't drink their Kool-Aid. I drank tea, by the way, but I didn't drink their Kool-Aid. And I left, I left that room knowing this is going to be a tough four years. I didn't drink that stuff they were offering. I didn't suck it up. I'm not going to do that. I didn't get elected, and I knew that, to go along to get along. So went in there, voted against the other four many times. But I explained why I voted the way I did. And these were mostly financial reasons I was there. But that four years, guys, was really awful. It's four years of getting this room full of people and people out there in society just bombarding you with hate mail, hate messages. So what I learned was that school board members who do their job, who stand there and say, no, we're not going to expose our children to pornography. No, we're not going to gender confuse our children. No, we're not going to offer some of the things that they're offering. We don't have to make our children use pronouns or respect somebody else's wishes for a pronoun that's not actually suitable for them. So, you know, anybody that stands against this force is absolutely ostracized and demonized and beat up on, bullied, intimidated in a variety of ways. And I prayed a lot that four years and I wanted to know why am I here? This is so miserable. But I have to tell you that within about four months of being on the school board, I did my best to respect the other four school board members and I told them so. Like guys, I know you're here voting your conscience, but please understand that I'm doing the same. But mine is being done, my votes are being done with the rest of the evidence. So if you sit back and you let the administrative staff tell you what they want you to vote and you don't ask any more questions or you don't go find some more homework, then I think that you're derelict, but that's, that's up to you. I'm gonna do my homework and I'm gonna tell the community why I vote the way I do. I'm gonna have this website. So each meeting I would say, hey, my explanation for the reason I vote the way I do is on my website. And boy, I was demonized for having my own website that I talked to the community with my own website. How dare you talk to the community? I thought, okay, that's my job. I'm pretty sure I swore an oath and the oath was to support the US constitution and the constitution of the state of Ohio, which both allow me the freedom to speak. And I'm going to exercise that. So some of that narrative doesn't come naturally for a lot of us out there because we're not used to having to defend ourselves like that. So in my four years of learning what I learned and thinking this is a bizarre world that I'm in, 
This world is not reality. Defending the children's rights, putting the children first, doesn't come naturally in that system. Uh, what is guiding this system? So uh, can I screen share, Andy? Can you put my presentation up? Because I wanted to show you a few things that I learned. Since then, though, I did not run for another four-year term. I determined from that that I really needed to teach people what is happening in public education and teach people how to combat that. I want people to run for school board, or I want you to support your school board if they are doing the right thing. And if they're not, we need to tell them they're not doing the right thing. The only way that a school board member knows that they're not doing the right thing is because you all in the community are writing to them and telling them. If they ignore the messages that we're sending, and it's the statistics that Andy presented, it's the statistics that, that Richard and Jamal presented, send them that data. Send them those PowerPoints, send them those articles, that research, the laws, send it to them. Because if they choose to ignore it, then they're derelict. Mm. What I found out was that, well, because I was sued, I, they threw everything they could think of at me. And that's the reason I was put in that position. That's what I came to realize after four years or three years. The reason I'm there was to learn how they intimidate and bully and get school board members to just sit there and be feckless bobbleheads. That's right, I said it. They've become feckless bobbleheads. People who don't do anything to protect the children. The reason is the bullying and the intimidation. So I learned all the tactics that they have, an unfair labor practice. What does that mean? I could explain it to school board members. Article after article in the newspaper disparaging me. I, I learned that's one of the ways they intimidate and bully, right? They get the media to do it with them. The union, the media, your legal counsel. For, found out from legal counsel when I was sued in federal court. That's another way they intimidate. I learned from legal counsel that punitive damages are not covered if a judge awards a plaintiff punitive damages against a school board member, that's not covered by indemnification, that the school board member has to pay that out of pocket. Now, I knew I was not going to be found guilty of anything that's negligent, which is what punitive damages get awarded for. But I'm telling the community citizens out here listening to me now, if you tell the school board members all the ways that this gender identity, gender confusion stuff is confusing children and harming children, you tell them how CRT is harming children, you tell them how uh, sexualization is harming children, show them the research, send it to them nonstop. If they refuse to acknowledge it and refuse to do something about it, then they're negligent. You understand? Yeah. Then they can be found guilty and be awarded punitive damages. The plaintiff be awarded punitive damages. That now is not indemnifiable. That now becomes something that can be attached to their personal assets. Maybe they'll start paying attention. That's what I'm saying. Okay, so I'm giving you a little tidbit here and their insurance company will tell them we don't cover you if you're awarded the judge awards the plaintiff punitive damages. I found that out, but I wasn't worried about it. But these board members who ignore the evidence and let the school district harm the children anyway, I'm saying they're fair game. Okay, maybe we have to litigate them into compliance with the citizens of the community. Okay, so first of all, I then stopped running for school board. After I learned everything I had to learn, tough as it was, I started going around the state and now around the country explaining what public education is all about. I do call it a cartel because if you look up the definition of a cartel, you'll see it's an association of manufacturers and suppliers, suppliers with the purpose of maintaining prices at a high level and restricting competition. If you'll notice the state affiliated associations, so state school board in, in Ohio, it's Ohio School Board Association. They work with the teachers union. And I have said publicly that they are an arm of the teachers union. They didn't like that and sent me a letter to cease and desist saying that. And I thought, I don't have to cease and desist saying that because you've proven it yourself. They have a website that says we work with the Ohio Education Association to stop school choice. They work to stop it and they coach school board members on how to stop it. They coach school board members to write resolutions opposing school choice in their state. So I don't have to stop saying it. They are. They're truly 
are. Okay, so there's next. Uh, how do I progress that? Okay, I'll let Andy get it for me. Thank you, Andy. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so I talk to people wherever I go. I've probably done 150 presentations across Ohio and across the country about why education is failing our students. It's because it's completely controlled by the, some people call it socialist group. I'll just call it what I believe it is. It's communists. It's controlled by the communist teachers union. So they can't stop me from saying this. I still have freedom of speech and I'm going to exercise such. So anyway, uh, the extra, the internal, excuse me, the international measures of teaching effectiveness are out there. I often use PISA, but here's some of the others, Tim's and NAEP. Next slide, please. I'm, I'm gonna go through this fast. I know you've been listening for a long time and I appreciate that. But I wanted to show you how we know that they've been dumbing down our students. When we compare our results, our international results to other countries. At first there were 65 other countries involved in taking this PISA, this international academic, it's like a, a standardized test. Back in 2000, we were seventh in reading, 18th in mathematics, and 14th in science. By 2015, we were 23rd in reading, 39th in mathematics, and 24th in science. Is there any doubt that the purpose is to dumb down the population, to dumb down our students? Now, they get the students get angry when I say that. They go, how dare you say that? I think, I don't have to say that. It's not a Cole's opinion. It is fact. And, they, and nobody denies it. I don't care where you on are on the um, uh, education or the political continuum. From the far right to the far left, they all acknowledge that this is happening and what a shame it is. What we disagree about is how to fix it because they think it's more people, more money. And we've been doing that. So I'm gonna show you that in a second there. Next slide. NAEP, this is the number of students, just look at it real quick. Again, I'm gonna send this PowerPoint to Richard because he can give it to anybody that asks him for it. I want you to have this information. But see, this is the number of our students uh, ready for the next grade level um, of information. You see how it's no more than 40% are ready for the next academic grade level? It's horrific. This is the national numbers. So this is competency, this is proficiency. I'm gonna show you a couple more. Next slide, please. This, um, I'm showing you that since 1970, the black line at the bottom is the pupil population change, which is 8%. I get my glasses on to see that number, but 8%. What you're seeing, the blue line is teaching staff change. So since 1970, there's been a 8% increase in students, a 60% increase in teaching staff, a 84% total in total staff in public education, and a 138% increase in non-teaching staff. Mm. Right, so that's the evidence that we've been throwing people at this education system. So like I said, some people have been influencing um, federal and state laws and they've been influencing them to create more membership in the unions and it's been working. So they acknowledge education academically is failing but they're able to influence through lobbyists our solution and our solution in their opinion is to add more people. Okay, next slide, please. So this is another figure, and this is since the 1950s. So even if you go back another 20 years, we still see a 96%, so that's where the baby boomers really came into the, the numbers, but 96% increase in students, a 252% increase in teachers, and a 700% increase in the other staff. So you see, again, we have added a lot of people to education system to try to fix what was failing. And they started identifying that we were academically decreasing since the 1970s easily. Next. <laughs> Accountability. We still have uh, no teacher evaluations based on student performance. We still have tenure. Tenure is the guaranteed job for life, whether you're a good teacher or not. It's really extremely difficult and expensive to get rid of a bad teacher. 
We still have poor performing school districts. They're still able to operate, even if we know they're failing, lots of them are, but cut scores are alarmingly low. And what I'm talking about here is cut scores, meaning that what it takes to be, to call a student proficient. So in Ohio, we have a whole chart that I think I have in this slide presentation of what it takes to have a student be proficient. And in all cases, the student can fail the standardized test, meaning a 50% or less, and still be called proficient. Now, I think that if you told the parents that your student got a 47% on that standardized test in math, that parent's probably not going to say, okay, they're proficient, let's move on. That, and the problem is when I was a um, parent with a student in the school district, I would get these beautiful charts that would show that my child was proficient and would have a big bar on them. Mathematics, big bar, 450 uh, points. I think, I don't know what that translates to as far as percent, but it looks impressive. So I would move on. I didn't know that that meant that my student only passed 47% of the questions correctly. And so each school district in Ohio only needs 80% of their students to fail that exam I'm saying that proficient is failing or, or less to fail that exam or better before they get a point on the education indicators. And the more points they get, the more they're likely to be rated a C, B, A district. So it's, it's a little bit of a deception or it's a lot of a deception to tell your community that your school district is, is an A district because the community doesn't know that it's, the bar is incredibly low. It doesn't wow. take much to get to be an A district. And so lots of parents that say to me, my school district's doing really well. I think, oh, you don't know the rest of the story. And if you did, you would say, I need to pull them out and educate them myself. So that's finally what I did. When I left the school district, I said, I can no longer in good conscience, trust you to educate my kids. The last two have to come home with me. <laughs> okay. So anyway, we still have relatively no competition. School choice is just not in every state. And it's really restricted in most states still. Only about 10% of our students are saved. That means they go to private or homeschool. So we still have to have a lot more change in there. Oh, by the way, I it didn't say this, but in Ohio, they changed the graduation um, criteria. And I, I believe they've done this in many states, where in Ohio, you only have to attend school. You don't have to pass a single course in high school to get a diploma. I'm serious. You only have to attend. That's it. So there's a certain percent that you have to attend of these classes and you get a diploma, whether you pass the classes or not. And I only knew this because another school board member called me and said, Kelly, did you know? He said, we have, we have students here who don't pass most of their, fail most of their courses, but they're still getting a diploma. Now, I would say that that's deceiving to employers out there when the student puts down that they have a diploma. An employer typically thinks that that means something, that there's some minimal benchmark. I call it minimum competency that that student has. It would be reading, writing, and maybe some math, right? <laughs> but that's not true. They only have to attend and they get a diploma. So I'm saying the bar is so low. I even say we've, been, we've run over that bar so many times. So the curriculum doesn't matter. So instead of spending time, and this is what's so important to what you're talking about here, instead of spending time working on academic excellence and raising that bar and making sure our kids can read, write, arithmetic, science, they know some of this stuff. We're spending time on sex ed. We're spending time on occupying their minds with this pornography that's in our books. We're, we're occupying them time, their time with what pronoun do you wanna use? CRT, SEL, 1619. We're telling their brains something that's not academically challenging. We're emotionally, social, emotionally manipulating them and not academically educating them. It's a shame. And so this is showing the amount of money. The blue line is the amount of money. Now this is old statistics because Cato hasn't um, given me the newer stuff, but the blue line is the money spent in education. The other lines at the bottom are the scores and I think this is uh, reading, math reading math and science scores yeah, for this age group. Oh. Hadn't changed. They haven't changed. 
but we have been flooding the system. So my point was we have flooded the system with money and people, which they typically go together. Has it changed any academics? If anything, they've lowered since 2000. Uh, again, the same thing, but I think these are SAT scores. 17 year olds, yeah, same problem. Money, we flooded it. We spend more than any other nation on our education system. But we're not getting the results. Next slide. Uh, okay, study. No link between school spending and student achievement. And I've got the reference down here. I think we can see that <laughs> from my previous two slides. Next slide, please. Okay, oh, next slide, please. If I've got the wrong presentation. Remember, education adults have increased 10 times greater than the number of children. Since 1970, 84% more adults compared to 8% more children. Next slide. Okay, this is the chart I was telling you about. Oh, it looks a little fuzzy to me. Does it to you guys no, from the other end? Okay, well, these are the cut scores. And again, I'm going to send this to you. I don't believe this is different than other states have. It's incredibly low cut scores. Those are the percentage of student needs to be called proficient. And all the parent gets is a report that they're proficient or accelerated or advanced. They don't get the actual percent score on this chart that comes to them. So they don't know because certainly parents would say, say wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, my student only got a 47%. I wouldn't call that proficient. I would call that failing. You know, so parents need to know this information because they are supreme and they would come in and say, we need more accountability from you. But instead, we're filling our academic day with stuff that doesn't make sense. Go ahead. Within about four months, those other board members were voting with me. So the 4-1 board that we had for a while became 5-0. But it became 5-0 because I was telling them the rest of the story. But what happens, what I witnessed, is that what happens is your school board member is the red in the middle. They're hugely insulated by the people talking to them. And it's usually not the citizens. It's usually their legal counsel, the superintendent, the treasurer, the state association that tells them how to be a good school board member is to go elect, to be a united front, show the community that you agree with the other one. But Simon, school board members are saying, I don't agree with you. But they'd say, once the vote is taken, you need to support the vote. Mm, no, I don't. <laughs> if I didn't support it before they voted, I don't magically all of a sudden become a different person and support it after they voted. They could have outvoted me, but I still disagree. And I have the right and the responsibility to say so. And I'm not gonna stop saying so just because the other four disagree, right? So school board members are so insulated that they don't speak out because they're being told you shouldn't speak out. You shouldn't say your opinion. Because if you dis disagree with the other four, the other four, you know, have the wood, <laughs> but they don't, but they don't. It doesn't make sense. And if it doesn't make sense, it can't stay. So I now then after 2014, when I left the school board and actually before that, I started the Ohio School Board Leadership Council. I went around the state and I told people that we have another way to do this. You don't have to listen to the school board association. Your job is different from what they're telling you. So you need to do what you need to do. I'm gonna form this organization that will coach you to be different, to be what the community hires you to be, right? So I did that, I did presentations all over Ohio. Kimberly Fletcher of Moms for America called me a year ago March. She said, Kelly, we need you to do what you do, teaching school board members how to be good school board members. The real good school board members nationally. And we're gonna help you. And so I started the National School Board Leadership Council. And we're an organization that's gonna start a chapter in every state. And we're gonna teach school board members what their rights and the responsibilities are. 
and it's to protect children. It's to speak for the parents and the citizens in your community. It doesn't matter what, what they say inside the district. The district and the personnel inside, the staff and faculty, they have representation. School board members, you're there to represent the community, the parents, and the students. That is your job. So you have to stop listening to these people that have you surrounded and do your job. And I'm here to teach them what their job is. Exposing what's happening like Wendy's doing in her left turn um, is part of their job. Because only when I exposed things did it get addressed. Only when I said things out loud at a board member or a board meeting. Of course there were gaps in the room. <laughs> Who said it out loud? I said it. If anyone else here can see that 23% of our students that graduate don't meet the minimum standards, you should get into college. Now this is in one of the school districts that's supposed to be the best of best. In Ohio, the average is 41% of the time. Do you know what it is now? And this was back in 2012. Do you know what it is now? 10 years later, 75% of the students that get diplomas in Ohio do not meet the minimum competency to get into a college without speaking out immediately. 75%. That's the latest number. Tell me that they're doing a good job. I, I, can't, I can't believe that. We have work to do, and it's not to gender confuse. It's not to social, emotional train children to think about things in their future. Our job is very different, and we're going to rely on our school board members to help them with that today. So thank you. Do, are there any questions? Lanny. So you turned uh, four four to one into five zero, right? Right. Or God did, right? Right. <laughs> right. So, so after you left the school board, did they lose steam or? Uh, when I left the school board, so uh, tell you a little bit more. Um, in 2010 to 12, you know, it was a 4-1 board, but it turned pretty quickly into a 5-0 board. So they were pretty much aligned with uh, the same things that I was thinking. Mm -hmm. We stopped giving tenure. We felt that tenure was, um, well, actually, we felt that tenure protects bad teachers. It does not protect good teachers. It doesn't teach good teachers key things. So it was kind of worthless. We stopped giving tenure because I felt it wasn't helping children learn. But things like that, so we became a 5-0. But there were two school board, excuse me, there were two people in, in the community that I had contacted that had voiced their opposition opinion to the board. And I thought, I'm going to reach out to them and see if they're like-minded. And they were. They formed an uh, organization called o Educate Springboro. Uh, they were giving a lot of great information on their website. And, and I'd asked them to run for board. They decided to run for board. I told people that these are two good people I think you should elect. They won. Uh, we took board majority, and I became the board president uh, from then on. So it worked out pretty well because all I was doing was speaking to the community on behalf of the students, and they agreed with me, um, mm -hmm. and they hired two more people just like me. So once they left, once I left, they were in the boor board minority. Mm -hmm. And the board majority had switched back to the go-along to get-along, back mm -hmm. to the bobbleheads, mm -hmm. and they just went back to doing everything they had done before. They did whatever the administrative staff told them to do. It was very disappointing. So yeah. we have to have a majority. I say it's not even, you know, right wing or left wing. It's it's common sense. And so what I think the school board associations do is they teach uh, school board members not to use their common sense. So, you know, creating these foundations that Richard is talking about or no left turn in ed education is talking about, it just is common sense that we create mm -hmm. these foundations for these children, that abstinence is common sense. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to give you a whole lot of information about it. It just is common sense that that would be your go-to in mm -hmm. teaching or not to socially, emotionally manipulate children's uh, heads. Mm -hmm. So um, what's the biggest factor which uh, causes board members to tend towards the, the you know, the bobblehead life. I love that you asked that, Jamal, <laughs> because what I thought was the biggest factor in changing school board members into 
just go alongs, even if they disagree. It's that training that they get the first weekend before they're even a board member. So just after being uh, sworn in, when they're told what their job is, and it's not, it's a lie. That is not what their job is. And so their coaches are telling them, here's what you do. And often these school board members think, oh, they're, they're affiliated with the state law. They know state law, but they manipulate it. They mm-hmm. don't tell school board members your rights and your responsibilities. So mm-hmm. I had to form this alternative organization so the school board members would learn what their rights and responsibilities are. Mm-hmm. I see. So they, they evaluate their behavior according to this um, initiation that they get. When this they coaching. Take the, the, the this coaching. And the coaching, coaching. is terrible. It's terrible. So and then and I, the I guess district, it's oppressive. Yes, it's oppressive environment. Absolutely. So they sit there intimidated. The board members will sit mm-hmm. there very intimidated to speak because they're told by this mm-hmm. association. Remember, association often means union, right? So mm-hmm. they're told by this association that your job is to go along with the board majority. And I rejected that message from day one. And I didn't go along with the board majority. So I think that's the way to go is Mm -hmm. you have to vote your conscience based on the evidence, based on the facts. And the community tells you. And I always said, well, I'm just representing the community. I'm not representing Cole's opinion. I'm representing the community. The community doesn't agree with the way you're spending money. The Mm -hmm. community wouldn't agree with this pornography in their schools. But I'm going to let them know that the books are here in the library and that they need to come review them. Boy, that would not go well. But you have to do that. They have to take a leap of faith and say, you know what? The community is speaking to us. The community doesn't want these children exposed to what they're being exposed to. The community mm-hmm. would like abstinent, abstinence-based education mm-hmm. or sex ed. Um, so these board members have to, have to know that going along to get along is not protecting the children's rights or the parents' rights or the community's opinions. They don't know that right now because they're being coached not to do that. The agency that coaches them, um, are they 100% activists? I don't know, but I know that their speakers at their conferences are not like-minded with us. And I pointed that out one time. I published um, an announcement that, oh, guys, I guess it was by accident, but the Ohio School Board Association just sent an oath of office to all newly elected school board members and their school districts that forgot to put in the U.S. Constitution. So they were swearing an oath, but it omitted swearing an oath to the U.S. Constitution. I thought, after 65 years in business, do you think that was an accident? I don't know. Are they activists? You could call them what what you like. But I noticed that their speakers at their conferences were often people that were social justice warriors. Again, is that more important than mathematics? How about, how about having speakers about how to effectively educate your students on the academic subjects? But that's not what their conferences were about. Okay, can I ask a question? Um, to piggyback on what he's saying, what about what does that have to do with um, special ed and, and mental health uh, in the school system? They don't have a lot of, um, I guess in my daughter's school, when she came from Maryland, they had it out there, but I noticed in D.C., and I'm not too sure, I can't quote that, but they do IEPs and then stuff like that. So I'm wondering why they don't test these kids um, to see if they're academically ready for school. Because some of them might need to be in a, a, a school for people that need special learning. But they do. That testing is done in kindergarten on every single student, repeatedly for the first several years of their academic careers. They test them nonstop. And and students with the IEPs, by the way, are pretty attractive to school districts because they get a lot more money for students that are on IEPs. Now, whether they spend that money on the IEP services is another question, but that's why parents with special ed students and students that are on an IEP often sue the school district because the school district is not giving them all the services that the state mandates, but the state's giving them that money. That happened repeatedly in our school district and most school districts that I'm aware of get challenged often, but 
those special needs students are attractive to school districts. It brings in the cash. So they do give them the tests. I'm not sure they give them the services. That's what I'm saying. Uh, Kelly, in, in order by the effect you've had in, in your state, um, what would you say are the uh, personality or uh, professional requirements of people who want to um, copy what you've done? Yeah, you do ask some really good questions. So what I would suggest is that any community member would make a good school board member. You do not have to have any kind of special degrees. You just, uh, here's what I say when I'm kind of training those candidates is that if you don't absolutely love children, I just don't think it's for you. If you don't absolutely love the whole act activity of educating children, I, I don't suggest you run. But if you have those two criteria, you know, I, I absolutely love children. I only had five because my husband was a party pooper. <laughs> He thought, he thought I could only afford five. Uh, so he, he stopped our family from growing. But I would have had, and he said, Kelly, you, you'd have a dozen. We're going to have to get a bus. I said, I know, I would. I don't want to stop. I don't want to stop it at five. But I absolutely adore children and the process of learning. And so I went into the position simply wanting to do the best I could do in protecting the children's rights. And I wanted to do what, what it, came to me in my head as the right thing. And I wasn't going to listen to a bunch of rhetoric that didn't make sense. Because if it doesn't make sense, it's not true. And often that's what I found is that the board members were often lied to. I mean, lied to. It's, it's perhaps in the best interest of the administrative staff. And what I found, I'm just telling you my conclusion, was that most of what they were telling school board members was to hoard the money for the adults. That's what I saw. They didn't want to spend money on student activities, student projects, student initiatives, because they didn't want to spend the money. We had the money. We didn't actually need the $30 million they were on the ballot for. We actually found another $12 million. We found that 30 and another $12 million. Oh, that was after I got the two school board members elected and we became board majority. We started asking for a whole lot more detail to spending. We started spending differently and the students became our priority. Every question we asked then was, how does that help students learn? And if, if it helped students learn or kept our students safe, that's what we spent the money on. So we stopped hoarding the, the money and fencing it off for our contracts. We said, we're not going to fence that off anymore. We're going to put the students first. We'll see what's left after we do that. So it's a different philosophy. Okay. Did that answer your question? Sorry, but I do like your question. So th I guess the, the attributes that a, that a person needs to run for school board is simply common sense helps uh, rejecting some of the narrative that they get in their so-called training, rejecting that and to understand their rights and responsibilities, which my organization teaches them. That's all they need is to understand their rights and responsibilities. I'm on the phone most of every day, simply coaching school board members on how to respond to stuff that they're getting. And it's bullying from every angle. And I saw, is it Bridget? Uh, I saw a question on here. Brigitte. Yeah. Brigitte can, no, can you, no. Yeah, ask a question, please. I don't have one. Okay. Can you hear me? I hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, we hear you. Uh, Oh, really? I didn't know. I have the microphone on. I, I, I'm in Germany. Oh, you are. Wow. You're a long way away. Well, but the thing is, I was on. Huh? Yeah, I, I was on the school. Go ahead. I was on the school. There's board a for delay. A There's a delay. Oh, I see. I was on the school board for a long time and I fought these battles and, you know, I, I didn't. Anyway, it, it didn't really help. I, I felt like it becomes more and more. They said, we don't need you anymore, all these people. We just run the thing ourselves. Right. And then I realized, it, yeah, the, the school, when I started being on the school board, it was like, oh, yeah, we can fight, we can talk. But it stopped after a while. And then the sex sexualization is, is really horrible. Yeah. Here in Germany. I, I agree. Yeah. Uh, in the kindergarten, they have books. My friend was reading a book about 
Jessica Love or something. This about a mermaid, and it's it's the grandma taking the child to the uh, love parade. I'm just saying, this is here too, and this is kindergarten. So it's it's everywhere, and it's whatever you said. It's not something from America. It's the same thing here. So it's normalizing the abnormal and telling children that all of this stuff, anything goes, all of this stuff is okay. What it does is undermine their foundations. So the foundation is that I know I'm a boy or I know I'm a girl. The foundation is I like my country. I think we're, we're growing up in a nice country, a good country, and, and I'm solidly supporting it. The foundation of my family, my family is who I rely on for the rest of my life, right? Mm -hmm. So undermining those foundations give children an unstable environment and they get lost. And then they Absolutely. look for government to say, okay, where are, where are my foundations? And, oh, here it is. It's government. Government's going to tell you how to live your life. And there are yes. no foundations there anymore. It's, it's psychological abuse. And I saw that in 2010 when I was on the board when they showed us a video of a teacher who was assessing comprehension to what the children were reading. So she went around the classroom to these fourth graders, and she would ask each one of them, how did that story make you feel? So instead of asking what, where, when, how, why, which is how we often acknowledge uh, uh, assessing comprehension, she was eliciting an emotional response to what they read. Because if you can manipulate a child's emotional response, you can manipulate them into thinking that it's really sad polar bears might have less ice, but it's okay to murder an unborn child. See, it's really easy to manipulate then how they vote and how they act if you teach them to think emotionally and then you give them the guidelines to thinking emotionally instead of the facts. The facts are who, what, when, where, how, why, right? The facts are the story. They don't come out with that when they're trained to think emotionally. So this instability creates them as these useful, as some people say, idiots. I don't think they're idiots. I think they're useful soldiers for their movement. That has to stop. That's not why we're teaching kids. Yeah, that has well, to do with uh, identity. You know? Exactly. Yeah, because when you're talking about the foundations of identity, identity, identity always lives within a narrative. Right. So you're not allowed to think that, you know, your country is a stable place to emanate from. Your family is not good enough reason to be proud your your gender whatever and yeah it is it is it is a form it's diabolical form of hate because yeah. you're, you're you're hating the kids by getting them to hate themselves to get yeah. getting them to hate everything that brought them into existence and reject everything they're being taught at home yeah and then the real. only way to resolve that is to mutilate yourself yeah. You know, I mean, they're literally cutting penises off. <laughs> like, it's disturbing. You know, literally, I, I have to mutilate my country. I have to mutilate my gender. I have to mutilate the family, in, right, in order to get these people's approval. Right. You know? It's disturbing. I found it to be bizarre. Much of what was happening in the school district was the, was the opposite of common sense. Mm -hmm. And and so I, I had to say that sometimes. And you can if you YouTube my name, you'll see a lot of my videos where I'm talking to groups and some of them mm -hmm. where I'm on the school board. And I'm mentioning that my daughter was forced to read the likes of Howard Zinn. Howard Zinn is a known Marxist. He claims he is himself. Okay. He is not a historian. Uh, if you ask any historian about Howard Zinn, they'll say he's not a historian. He's a fictional writer. Yeah. And that's the kind of history book that she was told to read before she entered AP history. She loved mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. But she came to me with this book and said, Mom, this book is very disturbing. And I don't know why, but it's bothering me. And I said, oh, Harper. So it's funny we're in Harper's Ferry. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I said, oh, Harper, you big weenie, give me that book. And so I, I read the book and she was on page 22 of a 700 page book. I was on page seven before I wanted to throw it into the fire because it was such a bunch of nonsense. And yeah. it actually talked about corporations as being corporate crocodiles. It talked about our faith as being, you know, nonsense and crazy and hypocritical. And I thought, I'm on page seven and I'm so angry with what I'm reading. What are all these kids in the summer reading this book for? This guy is, is a fictional writer who obviously hates this country, obviously hates faith, obviously hates family. 
why are they being forced to read this? So I went to the instructor and said, what, what's going, what's going on here? And he says, well, it's in my instructional manual that this is what they're supposed to read. They're reading this book in, in college. I said, but why would you have them do this when they, he said, well, they need to read all sides. I said, well, all sides, this is a fictional writer. He's not even a historian. So under no circumstances will my daughter read the likes of Howard Zinn, but I bought her a different book. And parents, you have the right to say that and say, my child will not read this book. I found her a book by Larry Schweigert. He was a professor at University of Dayton. He came to our school board meeting at my request and talked about why it's important to get American history correct. And he wrote the book, The Patriots History Book of America. I bought her that book. She said, thanks, mom. It's still 700 pages. <laughs> <laughs> It didn't save her anything, but it was an accurate. He said, I, Larry Schweiger, Dr. Schweiger will tell you that he, his history book gives both the good and the bad and the ugly. He'll give all sides in his book, but it's more of a true, factual, documented history of the United States, not a fictional book of the United States history uh, by Howard Zinn. Thank you. I just want to give you, I want to give you guys some good news. Yeah. Okay. We, we, we've been telling you a whole lot of bad news about the state of our education system, the state of sex ed, the state of our country, and all the problems we got. Okay, here's some good news for you. Yay. <laughs> there are states and there are parents that are stepping up and fighting back. I told you, you know, our state, we, we passed a law. We got 22 books removed just out of one school district that contained the state definition of pornography. A state, a federal judge recently sided with the school board and told a school district and, a, and all school districts in the United States do have the authority to remove any books from their schools that they do not find age appropriate. So if it's not age appropriate for the kids, they have the right to pull it. We do have a federal judge that has stood up and said, hey, and made a decision that school districts do have the authority to determine curriculum over, uh, over a curriculum developer. And that was another recent case in the United States. A, federal, a school board basically said, wait a minute, we don't want to teach this in our school district. And by the contract that they had signed with this curriculum developer, the Korean girl said, no, you have to teach what I developed for you. And they ended up going to court because the school district wasn't teaching it. And they ended up fighting back and they won. The point is, there are some wins going on. Parents are starting to step up and fight back and say no. There are some really good outcomes happening because parents are getting involved. Citizens are getting involved. I keep saying parents. Citizen, are you? If you pay taxes, you are paying for your local school. You have skin in the game. You have money there. You got skin in the game. Absolutely. I don't care if you got no kids or no grandkids in the school district. If you are, if you pay taxes, you're paying for that school, and you need to get involved, and you need to get your friends involved, and you need to explain to people why they need to stand up and say something. Because when a community stands up and informs a school board of what they expect. It makes a difference. Okay. Well, you get me charged up, Andy. <laughs> Dr. Coles, thank you so much. Wow. And Andy Wells, thank you. Jamal Johnson, thank you. And all who have joined today. And also all who are here in Harpers Ferry at the Peace Kingdom Center. We really appreciate you uh, coming on. And... Um, to this family strengthening forum. And we also had, and we'll repeat quarterly, a um, abstaining to achieve success and happiness curriculum training. We shared just a tiny bit of it in my presentation. We also had an exposition of divine principles study. So I highly recommend that as well. Understand God's will. So I do thank you very much for joining us today. And we will have another family strengthening forum next quarter. And I will make materials available uh, on our website or by email, whatever is appropriate, you know, that they uh, give, uh, the speakers give to us. So, yes, thank, thank you again. And 
So this will officially uh, end our Family Strengthening Forum. And thank you for uh, joining. Thank you, Richard. Yes, you're welcome. And thank you. Thank you so thank much you. for coming on. Well, everybody, really, really appreciate it. Thank you it. from I'm Germany. I'm really happy that I joined today and listened. Thank you. And thank you. It was very inspiring. Yeah, and thank you so much for our speakers coming out from Ohio and Missouri to Harper's Ferry. Really, really appreciate that. I know it's a sacrifice. Okay, well, we'll see you next time. Thank you.